Hello and welcome to Full Global Headquarters here in Alexandria, Virginia. I'll be your host for today's discussion, Shannon Jones, and I am joined here by lead advisor Abby Mallon and Motley Fool co-founder and CEO Tom Gardner and a very creepy uh, weird head with a gesture cap on it as well, but welcome to all of you. It's great to have Alien Fool here with us. <laughs> yes. Just observing everything. Yeah, truly great. And we are most excited about you joining us because we're going to be talking about a topic that everybody else is talking about, and that is IPOs. So for today's discussion, we're going to be talking about first, why IPOs, why now? Some tips for investing in IPOs and some notable stocks. We'll also save some time for your questions, so be sure to drop into the comments. Go ahead and start submitting your questions now, and we'll get to some of those at the end of the show. Also, we've got a free special report for you, so you want to make sure that you go to fool.com slash IPO and type in your email address to get that report delivered to your inbox. It's really a great primer for getting started in the IPO space. and talking about some notable stocks as well. Um, before we really dive into everything, Tom, I, I want to... I wanna... Historically, the Motley Fool has tended to kind of stay on the sidelines mm -hmm. when it comes to IPOs. Mm -hmm. But now we're actually starting to pay more attention. So the question to you is, why IPOs? Why now? Well, 26 years into the Motley Fool, um, yes, we have generally stayed away from IPOs. I would say we've avoided them altogether, but there are some realities about IPO investing that we need to put on the table here for everyone, and that's part of the reason we're excited about talking about them now, to make sure to inform everyone as much as possible so you make smart decisions about these investments. The first is that there are usually around 200 IPOs a year, ballpark in the U.S. market, and the universe of those IPOs actually isn't very Good, a, a good performing area of the market. So most of these companies aren't going to be good investments. There are a lot of small companies, um, there are speculative businesses in there, and in general, the second reason we kind of tend to stay away from IPOs is that people think of them as short-term transactions. Like when people talk about investing in IPOs, they're, they're talking about getting in as early as possible and maybe selling a month later for a profit. That's just not a great way to make money. If you were investing in the Netflix IPO in 2002, you wanted to hold all the way through because that's up 300, more than 300 times over the last 17 years. So we want to teach people the importance of really focusing on the quality of the business and the long-term investment. That said, IPOs represent the fresh blood coming into the market, new uh, businesses that will change the world. A fraction of them will have dramatic impact on the world, and we want to be out there investing in them. Yeah, I would just add, um, so Tom talked about their underperformance. About 60% of stocks of new IPOs underperform the market. So. Um, and the average IPO or the median IPO underperforms by about 38%. So it's down 38% after 10 years of holding. Mm. But what's interesting about that is if you look at the graph on the screen, you'll see that we actually did a little bit of research. So a dollar invested in every IPO since 1995 and held for 10 years, which gives you an, about 200 or 2,200 companies, um, that whole group will actually outperform the market significantly. So um, while the average individual IPO declines about 38% over that 10-year period, the group as a whole outperforms. So what this tells us is that there actually are some really large outliers in terms of the upside, mm. that which is where we're trying to get people to focus and look for and um, get excited about those quality companies. Yeah, what's great about that, Abby, is you've done literally hours and hours and hours of Days research. Days and weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Into the IPO sector, um, really trying to uncover specific themes what is it that really makes those winners stand out? And so I'm excited that we're focusing on this, excited that we're teaching people to apply the same foolish principles to IPO investing that we've always been um, just so passionate about. I want to talk a little bit, though, because um, in our discovery universe, we've got a discovery ecosystem. Um, Tom, we've got a framework for successful mm -hmm. investing, and mm -hmm. it's really a three-part framework. It's mm -hmm not just about the stocks you buy, mm -hmm. but it's really about how you allocate capital mm -hmm. to the stocks and your cash position, and it's also about managing your emotions and your temperament and behavior, sometimes the hardest part of mm -hmm. investing. Definitely. Um, let's talk a little bit about the allocation side. What exactly does that look like when it comes to IPO investing? Mm. I think allocation is important in IPO investing um, because the volatility of that subset is going to be very high. So um, 
we've talked a lot about as a team how IPOs aren't an asset class per se because the only thing those companies really have in common is their timing to enter the public market. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say they shouldn't be more or less than X percentage of your portfolio or things like that. But um, keeping in mind that raised level of volatility that you will see, I think people need to take their sort of risk tolerance into account and be very honest about that because you will see IPOs tend to be a little bit more volatile, particularly shorter term. Mm, excellent point. I'll just add that across the board at The Motley Fool, we think you should own at least 25 different companies. So if you think about them all being equally weighted, that would be a 4% position in each, right? So um, IPOs could be all 25 of those companies. That would mean you're going to have a very volatile ride, um, and you are relying on companies that are just coming into the public markets just doing public filings for the first time, leadership um, you know, with different responsibilities, a lot of legal obligations for a business that's public and has retail shareholders and new institutional shareholders. So those companies are going through some new dynamics. You're going to have higher levels of volatility. I myself would say, why, why put all of your portfolio into IPOs? That's probably a bad idea. But having a collection of them, or if you are willing to own 50 stocks or 75 stocks, which I think is a great idea, you know, having 25% of your portfolio in IPOs, sure, anywhere from 10 to 25%. Of course, you want to be looking at the businesses. You're not there to just see if you can get a 15% return in 10 days. You will get that at times with IPOs, but you'll also, if you play the game that way, you're also going to get some knocks. You look at a company like Beyond Meat that's gone public, it's had an incredible run, but I mean, in any given day, it's up or down 10, 15, 20%. You don't want to be emotional at the time when you make any investment, and, and you want to have a good collection of businesses, more than 25. Great. And so let's talk about managing your temperament and managing your behavior, because that's key, really, whether or not you're investing in IPOs, but really any type of stock. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that actually looks like when it comes to this very volatile asset class, like IPOs? Like, what, what does that actually mean for investors? No matter what situation you're going through, you want to maintain the same facial expression <laughs> at all times with your investments. Um, yeah, I'll just start by saying um, Warren Buffett has said that the number one reason he's successfully turned around $10,000 of investment money into more than $80 billion in his lifetime is that he really learned how to manage his temperament. So we naturally think, what stocks am I buying? I'm going to be trading actively, all these other things. That is, that is a third tier factor for Warren Buffett. He's really focused on his emotions and making sure he's set up for success in the long term. So again, if you're buying IPOs, first thing you need to know is you really shouldn't make any stock market investments that you hold for less than five years. There's a lot of data to support that throughout history, and I encourage you to look for that data. You'll see it in things like the IPO report, um, some good information on thinking about IPO investing from us for free. Um, but. But the, the first key there to managing your emotions is your time horizon. If you, if you hold things religiously for a minimum of five years, then if the market's down 10%, which it does on average once a year, that's fine. You're not going to be selling at that point. You might be adding to your position. So I think the first biggest thing about managing your emotions is locking in a long-term time horizon. Being a business owner, look, the executives of these companies, if they're super high quality, they're thinking about the next 10 years, as Jim Senegal did at Costco and so many other great leaders in the public markets. You don't want to be a short-term speculator. That's where you get really emotional. I would just add to that. So I think particularly with IPOs, people are very concerned about getting that IPO price. So. Um, when companies go public, the price is set, and then typically about 80% of companies have a successful IPO day, which means that their stock price at the end of their IPO day ends above where it initiated. And I think a lot of people harp on that and they feel like they missed out or they've lost this opportunity. Um, FOMO, fear of missing out, is very, very strong with IPOs. Mm -hmm. But actually, interestingly enough, our data shows that um, that initial entry price is really not pivotal to long-term outperformance. So, um, the data actually supports that it's just not that big of a deal, particularly when finding these great quality companies that are going to be industry leaders for the next 10 years. Yeah, I think one thing that really stands out from the research that we did internally is oftentimes you have investors that get really nervous around lockup expirations. Like, should I be holding? Yes. Should I wait? What are your thoughts about lockup expiration? Does it apply to how we're looking at IPOs too? Yeah, I think anyone allocating to IPOs should be ready to see that volatility, like we said, and maybe even take advantage of it opportunistically. So um, historically, the data will show that right before lockout period. Can you explain the lockup? Yeah, so a lockout period is um, a time in which companies and or insiders and um, bankers and people like that are not allowed to sell stock. So um, it's sort of 
there to provide price stability so that not everyone is trying to exit and cash out on their investments in that first uh, typically um, 90 to 180 days. And so as those lockout periods come early, um, people and algorithmic trading in particular tends to anticipate that there will be a lot of selling activity at that point. So you tend to see the stock price, even for successful IPOs, sort of trend downward as you get nearer and nearer to that point. And then there's sort of usually like a little bl bit of a blip and then stock goes on to trade um, a little bit more rationally after that point. So um, knowing that it's coming can be very helpful and then also using it opportunistically. So if this is a company that you like, you still believe in, um, I don't think fundamentally much changes with that lockout period. Of course, we do like to see high insider ownership. So if that declines substantially, maybe that's a little bit of a thesis change. But generally speaking, I don't think um, that period has any bearing on the company's overall well-being. So using it opportunistically can be very advantageous. Mm. One thing I'll just add to that is if we all trained ourselves to say the price of a stock within any given 12-month period is meaningless to my long-term return. Sometimes that won't be true, but if you had that as a rule in your mind as an investor, and you said, whether I buy today, three months from now, 10 months from now, whether the stock is 20% higher or 20% lower, is going to end up being meaningless over the long-term performance of this business inside of my portfolio. That is actually mathematically true in very successful portfolios. In the portfolios that win over the long term, that defer taxes by not transacting a lot, and that create generational wealth in families, whether you buy Netflix, at a split adjusted price of $1.10 or $1.80 in 2002 is utterly meaningless. But look at the price difference between that. That's more than a 50% you know, price difference between those, those two entry points. But here we are, the stock's at 345, 18 years later. And that's a company right in front of all of us, right? right? So if we train ourselves to find great businesses right in front of us and not worry where the price is in a given year, just be prepared to add to it over time, to accept that you'll have some mistakes along the way as well, I think that's a key component. And with IPOs, it means lock up expiration, first day, third day, 10th month. It really doesn't matter if you're a long-term holder. It matters what business you found to invest in. Okay, so we've talked about allocation. We've talked about mindset. Let's talk about stocks, because that's what everybody wants, right? So let's talk about stocks. Abby, for you, is there a stock, an IPO right now that's on your radar? And if so, why is it? Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about Pinterest around the office. I think um, Pinterest is particularly interesting. So they are a social media company, and they brand themselves as a leading source for product discovery and vis visual inspiration. So. Um, users can go on, browse lots of pins, which is like a little bit of a picture, and then you save them to your personal boards. You interact with them later. Um, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. So um, one thing I think the market is missing a little bit with Pinterest is that the um, perhaps it's a bit more of a niche product than other social media, so then like Facebook or Twitter, but um, the power within that network is actually very strong. So um, there isn't really a um, ad load constraint with Pinterest because they are so naturally ingrained in the product and people are spending roughly about a third of their time on the platform shopping, browsing, or researching um, products. So I think that's very powerful and I think we're still in the very early stages of Pinterest really monetizing that platform. They have 290 million monthly active users of Pinterest. That's an incredible number. They were the fastest company to ever get to 10 million active users in 2012. So they have created a, a platform and 80% of the users are female. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an area of the family budget where uh, the majority of spending comes from the woman in the household. So this is a, this is a very promising platform. And I think that they have room to um, commercialize it a little bit more. I think that there are some opportunities that they have to grow. So I don't think you're seeing everything on the table right now about Pinterest's potential. And yeah, I think we're pretty optimistic about this as a long-term business. And just to flag it in terms of the context of what we've been talking about, we're generally right about 60% of the time. So if we were to like Pinterest and invest in it, it's, it's a little bit better than a 50-50 chance. The reason we win so big at the Molly Fool is because we hold and the winners compound and become outsized winners. But I, I think we do like Pinterest a lot. Yeah, I think Pinterest is just an incredible platform for a number of different reasons, but even from an advertiser's perspective, when you think about their size to other social media advertising platforms like your Facebook, um, they're a much smaller player, but what we're seeing is that 
users actually are 39% more likely to make a purchase. So it's really driving, I think, purchase intent, mm -hmm. even more so than any of the other players. So that makes it an incredibly in compelling investment. Granted, to your point, Abby, I think they're still very early in being able to monetize that, but I think the international opportunity is also very huge for them, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to add there, international users represent more than two-thirds of the users on the platform, mm -hmm. but less than 5% of total revenue. So um, that's still a pretty nascent area for them that I feel like has a very, very long growth opportunity ahead. If we were to pin this character up with the belt hat on, Not that we would. how many of these do we think sell <laughs> off the Pinterest platform? Whole, the items together. Can we go negative? <laughs> I would say somewhere between <laughs> negative three and two. Probably. And there are two people we know. They would pay us <laughs> not to do it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's turn our focus though, because with um, an IPO market with a lot of big names out there, you have companies like Pinterest that appear to be really good investments, but you also have some that maybe they're more question marks than there are answers. Um, are, is there a stock in your mind right now that, that kind of fits that bill? Yeah, I would say Uber is one that has a lot of questions for me still. Um, I think Uber is sort of the epitome of what we call a unicorn IPO. So um, that's any IPO that's debuting on the market above a billion dollar valuation. It's pretty rare, historically speaking, but um, I think Uber was the one that sort of gave rise to this popular concept. Um, and I think people were very excited to see it go public, but I think we've seen a lot of management issues the past two years and leadership issues, guidance issues, strategic initiative issues. Um, and so, particularly with a young company like Uber, you know, they have so many advantages or so many opportunities ahead of them. Um, particularly, I really like their, um, not just the ride sharing mobility, uh, cars, scooters, bikes, but they also have their Uber Eats platform for food delivery. They also have an Uber Freight, which is like trucking on demand kind of. Um, which currently represents about 10% of the all trucking industry across the U.S., but is poised to grow much faster. Um, and then also their augmented reality. So there's a lot of growth areas, and I think a lot of that growth is being priced in right now without much, um, many clear pathways there. Mm. Part of the problem, I think, for Uber is that they waited so long to go public that their market cap was actually lower than expected when they when they finally came public, but it's still a market cap $70 billion business. And it's going to be hard to get a 10-bagger out of this. And again, it's going to be the 10-baggers that really drive the long-term returns of portfolios of growth companies. So if Uber had come public when it was a $10 billion market cap, right, you would have had a 7x at this point. And I think there would have been more market enthusiasm for it. So I actually, right. there is a bit of a problem for companies that are remaining private for very long periods of time. And in the case of Uber now, you've got kind of two f other forces I see working against them. I, I'm, I'm neutral on this company. I'm not saying don't own it. I think it could end up being a fine investment. It's not going to be a transformative investment, I believe, in people's portfolios. But I'd say two problems. One is there's a lot of discounting that's going on in the Uber versus Lyft competition. We'll see if there is like pricing stability when they're in a market together. Uber has some running room internationally. But in the U.S. markets they're in, they're, they're, they're working hard against each other. And that's generally not an, I, an ideal situation overall. And then the second thing is autonomous. Who's going to win the race there? That could be a transformative moment in this category. Whoever gets there first um, to scale. It could be devastating to Uber or it could be Uber. But again, at the market cap, they've come public. Even if they win that, I... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a bull that this is a, a five to 10 bagger for investors. Yeah, I mean, I would just add on that autonomous. I think to make these business economics really make sense and work and value the way investors seem to be um, suggesting that it would be, I think autonomous is going to have to play into this mm. platform, and that makes me a little bit nervous. And just to pile on, although let's, <laughs> I, we, I know we've got questions out there we're excited to take, but, and in order for Uber to get there, they're gonna have some labor issues from point where we are today to that point, right? I mean, you're essentially introducing autonomy alongside people who, who are on contract with you. And a company like Tesla, which has other issues that it faces, doesn't have that, that dynamic. They could just launch autonomous taxis, robo-taxis, without having to negotiate their way through their existing population of drivers. Great, great. So 
Continuing on with the Uber and Lyft theme, I want to get to some questions. Um, Let's do it. Uh, and this, I think, kind of ties in with Uber and Lyft because I know there have been a lot of concerns about just profitability mm. with a lot of these IPOs. Many of them don't really seem to have a path to profitability carved out. So we've got several viewers asking right now, should we be worried about profitability with these IPOs? Almost none of these companies are making money right now. You know, I think that should be a concern, but I, I think it's also the, the business that sits behind it. We are in a world now where you can create applications and have customers around the world in the first month. And when you have a market share opportunity like that, I'd say that there are some pretty good reasons to up your marketing costs and to spend a lot into R&D and to really just claim the innovative standard and to own that market as quickly as possible. So I see the benefit of it. The problem for me with Uber and Lyft is that the business model has a lot of cost layered into it, right? If we're talking about Zoom, we're talking about an application, or Slack. We're talking about software applications that are written once, replayed over and over again by a rising population. In those cases, I don't mind whether those companies are profitable or not. Shopify isn't yet profitable on its income statement, but it's been an unbelievable stock because people see they may own the e-commerce platform of the future. So in the case of Uber and Lyft, their, their lack of profitability in the underlying business model isn't my favorite. Um, versus some of the software companies and the SaaS companies that are coming public where I'm really just not that concerned about their level of profitability in their early years in the public markets. I think it's worth noting that the data does show that companies that are actually profitable do tend, IPOs specifically, um, they tend to outperform the IPO group as a whole. With that being said, I don't think it's the only factor that makes sense. And um, I know we've thrown the phrase around a couple times, but we do use the phrase path to profitability. So this really means that if you pulled levers X, Y, and Z, you can sort of see the company moving in a direction that would make them positive. So, um, for example, sales and marketing expense with these younger companies is also very, usually very elevated. And so if that's what's causing that sort of um, negative, I would say that's less concerning versus um, other factors that might be a little bit harder to ramp up or ramp down. Mm. So you got the profitable companies, you got the path, to profitability companies, mm -hmm. and then you have the winding uphill climb toward profitability. And we should draw some distinctions between those. And it is that third category we obviously should be worried about. They shouldn't right. draw the high valuations that they are in the marketplace today. If you've got a winding uphill path to profitability, you shouldn't be at 10 times sales or 20 times sales. It should be pretty clear to people the game that you're playing. All right, speaking of valuation, Angel asks, the Zoom hype has been crazy. Is the business worth the premium? I know this is a company we've talked about quite a lot here at The Motley Fool. It's technology we use here at The Motley Fool. What are your thoughts about Zoom and where it's priced right now? Um, so I'll start and say <laughs> it's a recommendation in, in our discovery partnership portfolio. So it's a business that we very much believe in for the long term. Um, it's owned by their founder. We really like to find leaders like Eric Yuan at Zoom, who is essentially saying, like, this is the only business I want to be at. That person is going to be in a situation where they have to make tough decisions along the way, and and you know there's a high valuation that sits on top of that, so there's definite pressure. But I do think long term, it's possible, it's possible that Zoom becomes a mass market brand around video conferencing. Now we can look at it and go, video conferencing, anyone can do that. What's so special? Actually, their technology has been built in a unique way to make sure that it really drops infrequently for people, which is the main complaint people have had about video conferencing over the years. But in my opinion, I know this is a bizarre take, but in my opinion, Zoom is the most exciting rideshare company on the market today. And what I mean by that is increasingly remote work, work from home, um, families separated, um, friends past, present, spread around the world. If Zoom becomes the connection point, why am I going to get on, a, on an HOV lane and try and get into work and it's 45 minutes? I mean, if I'm able to work effectively on Zoom, that could be the best transportation company, the very high margin, scalable, digital uh, transportation company. And, and I, I think th those are some reasons. But there's no question Zoom, over the next 10 years, their stock will be down. 40 or 50 percent a couple times when you have these high valuations and high growth companies, you have very volatile stocks. I would just add that Zoom is both net income and cash flow positive, so um, it is sort of the exception to not only IPO rules, but sort of the SaaS or um, more tech-oriented business rules. We have seen Zoom sort of um, beat the odds there, so I think part of that premium is a little bit deserved relative to um, the other players in the market. With that being said, I would agree that I think the market is very um, highly 
valued right now. It's an unbelievable valuation. <laughs> there are a few companies out there, Beyond Meat also. Beyond Meat's probably not one I'm as excited about, although I love the trend that they're going after. But I'd say when you look at Zoom, you're looking at a company, it's trading at what, I don't know, 50, 70. Actually, I'm going to look right now. That's the beauty of technology. I'm going to delay all of our time and waste all of our time to click two <laughs> little links and tell everyone what they're trading at as a multiple of sales. But it is it is off the charts. I mean, they're trading at 70 times sales. Wow. 70 times. It's tough to look back in history for even the greatest software companies, Microsoft, Oracle, Adobe, these incredible performers, very lightweight businesses. Uh, very profitable, they rarely ever traded above 25 times sales and that wasn't the best time to buy them. So here we are with Zoom at 80 times or um, you know, 71 times sales. I think if you're going to buy Zoom at these prices, you have to be prepared to add money at multiple times along the way and you got to have that five to ten year time horizon. Great. All right. So next question. Um, and I think this kind of ties into a lot of the research that you've been doing, Abby. But Paul asks, what would you need to see in an IPO to buy it when it lists or debuts instead of waiting? Like, what are some of the factors that you think are like things, yes, if it checks these boxes, I think this is now a great company to own and a good time to buy. I think when you're looking at IPOs in particular, um, one of our greatest factors of consideration is really the total addressable market, or what we call TAM. Um, so we want to see s relatively small companies going after a much, much larger addressable market. So um, in the case of Zoom, when it first went public, they were a very a relatively smaller company attracting that remote workforce, um, sort of displaced families, things like that. That's a much larger market than where they were initially priced. So. Um, in the case of Uber, on the flip side of that, Uber was a is now a seventy billion dollar company operating in that market share that is obviously much larger, but um, maybe a little bit smaller relative to the company size already. So, thinking about things relative to the total addressable market can be really helpful. Great. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about Beyond Meat, but I've seen several questions come in. Um, Raj, in particular, asks, is Beyond Meat something we should be taking seriously, or is it Beyond Stupid? I like what you did there, Raj. <laughs> also, have you guys had a Beyond Burger? Is it any good? I have not had a Beyond Burger. It's not something I wouldn't try. I also know the Impossible Burger and Impossible Foods is, a, I think, a compelling competitor to Beyond Meat. It's a private company. Um, overall, uh, I think that it's not as attractive an opportunity as some of the software companies that are out there at this valuation. So uh, it's going to be extremely volatile. Again, I guess my, my disposition or my inclination is to always buy a few shares of something that's interesting to you. Remember, if you have $100,000 to invest or $50,000 to invest, you can always invest $500 into one company. It's not going to have a material impact on your portfolio, but you're going to learn by having skin in the game. So if you're excited by Beyond Meat, go for it. I myself have not tried the burger. The valuation is, is pretty concerning to me, uh, but I definitely believe in the trend. I, I think we're going to have some huge breakthroughs in food. Remember this about food and food quality and what's happening. Processed foods, that was not a great innovation in the world. And there are a lot of legacy companies. They're going to have to fight their way forward and have been trying to, to get into the Whole Foods markets and to get into Thrive and other areas to, to meet the nutritional guidelines people are getting from their doctors. And Beyond Meat is sitting right where that world is going. That's very beneficial for them. I just think at this valuation, it's, it's, there are going to be many more attractive times to buy if you're interested in that company. I would say the thing that Beyond Meat did very well, I think their marketing department poised that stock, or poised that product very well. So um, rather than trying to cater to the vegans or the vegetarians of the world, Beyond Meat really went for the meat eaters. So it was, in the meat case, um, non-vegetarians or people that like meat also have now explored this product. I think their data shows that about 90% of their customers also bought meat within the same week that they bought Beyond Meat. So um, again, the trend makes a lot of sense. Moving people towards that, you know, these meat alternatives, I think makes a lot of sense. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how. Welcome to the Motley <laughs> Fool. Where there are bouncy <laughs> balls. I think we're safe. I <laughs> know. Um, <laughs> I would just say I don't know um, relative to their total addressable market. I think Beyond Meat as a market cap is now larger than the what we're already seeing in or consumers eating. So. You know what would be a great opportunity culturally to just kind of 
I flip our culture on its head is if Abby just took her microphone off and went out and yelled at them. <laughs> <laughs> Would not be the strangest up. thing to happen here at the moment. Well, we don't have much show. yelling. <laughs> I've we never yell. yelled. Just in terms <laughs> of oddities that happen, it Both would not. Both of us are angry at you, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Mann asks, hi, Tom. Ah, oh, Bill. Your computer is unlocked. Should I lock it? Thank you. <laughs> That's so good. Bill Mann, That's uh, one of our so dear good. employees here. All right, let's do one more question. Great. Um, we talked a little bit about making these small bets, so putting some money just to get a starter position. Um, Sean asks, can you give some overall guidelines for adding to your winners? I find it easy to know when to cost average down on stocks when it dips, but how do I know when to add to a winner? Hmm. Uh, maybe we'll each give two factors, and there are many others as you're thinking about this. Uh, certainly the first is just how much do you believe in the business more now than you did before. So again, if we if we just relegate valuation to a subordinate factor, I think it, it matters. It should be part of the equation. But really ask yourself, is that business becoming more relevant? What are their growth dynamics look like? Are there new opportunities for them to expand? Do I believe in them more? That's number one. And then number two would simply to be to look at their sales growth rates. Um, Let's take three different examples super quickly. First, a business that really isn't growing its top line more than like 3% a year, kind of at the rate of inflation. Historically, those businesses do not create a lot of value over the long term in the public market, so we're only interested in the long term at The Motley Fool. A second business is it's growing 20% a year, but last year it was growing 40% a year, and the year before is growing 55%. So the rate of sales growth is still high, but it's declining or decelerating rate. That, that's just an area of concern. It's a natural thing for businesses, but you want to be aware of that. Another biz, final third example would be a business that's growing at 20%, but last year it grew at 15%, and it's starting to accelerate its sales growth. When you find businesses that either have very high rates of sales growth or accelerating rates of sales growth, generally like take a company like Twilio. That's been a wonderful business to add to over time, and we have added to it in the discovery services. So um, I, I think sales growth is a good other indicator. I would add when you see a company sort of pursue new growth opportunities in a very tangible way. So an example of this would be Stitch Fix. When they came public, they had a woman's offering. Um, since then, they've added men's, they've added children's, they've added extras, um, lots of expansion there. So every time they add this new product sampling, um, your total addressable market gets bigger, their opportunity gets bigger, and that business really scales efficiently across of all of those products. So same sort of algorithm applied to a new product space. Um, that's very exciting. Great, great. Well, that will do it for us here at Motley Fool Global Headquarters here in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I want to thank Tom and Abby for Any joining Any feedback me today. for us on our, on our first live performance <laughs> ever out here? Eh. Yeah, okay, eh. good. We'll, we'll, we'll go there. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll upgrade. Uh, but I do want to thank all of our viewers for tuning in. I also want to thank our creepy junior uh, with the gesture hat thing here as well. Um, but more importantly, I want to make sure that you get a chance to get our IPO primer. So just go to fool.com slash IPO. Um, put in your email address and you will get that report. Um, again, we want to thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you see, be sure to subscribe to the Motley Fool YouTube channel. That way you can stay up to date on all of our videos and we have a lot coming your way. Also, be sure to give this video a like. Um, again, Come on. Like what you see, give us a like. <laughs> We're begging you here. You know, that always kind of bothers me on YouTube when people are there. Like, uh, thank you for watching our NBC video if you like. But, hey, we want as many fools out there getting as informed as possible about what we're working toward and thinking long term about their business investments. So, um, I hope, I dream of a day where YouTube is 24 hours a day live with The Motley Fool. I do not take that graveyard shift. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, folks, <laughs> we are signing off again. Thanks so much for tuning in. And be sure to check us out next time on YouTube Live. Thanks for watching and full on. Full on.